Tell us your story from where you were at to becoming an FBI agent. My brother Peter gave me a call and said, look, now that you're a prosecutor, we should do something about the director of the camp when we were kids. I went undercover. I met with the guy. I wore a wire and we locked up the guy. Correcting that injustice ended up with the agent pushing over an application to me and saying, you should join the FBI. Becoming a murderer, committing major crimes of taking someone's life. Is it nurture, is it nature? The way I like to summarize it is, genetics loads the gun, personality and psychology aims it, and your experiences pull the trigger. What do you mean when you say snipers have a God complex? It's not as easy to pull the trigger on human beings as it is on paper targets. Generally, people choose to snipe versus one-on-one -on -one contact with their victims because they want to feel omnipotent. They want to feel powerful. My guest today had a 22-year career with the FBI, and here's what's so interesting about him. I've interviewed a lot of FBI guys, and I've watched a lot of commentary and in interviews from uh, FBI agents. He was a supervisor, and this is probably one of the best teachers in the area of crime that I've seen myself on how they go about catching a bad guy, what is the idea of a sniper, why the sniper has a God complex, and is it nurture versus nature, the fact that somebody becomes a killer. The way he breaks it down is very interesting, and he's from an interesting family as well. Both he and his brother, two brothers, are FBI agents. Him and his other brother, Tim, are FBI agents. Peter took a different route, became a business owner, and now they're all running the business together which uh, we'll talk about maybe throughout the interview. But having said that, Jim, thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. offline before we started doing the interview. I was fascinated by your uh, style of teaching. But before we get into it uh, uh, on some of the questions I got, uh, I'd like to profile somebody today as well. Hopefully we'll be able to do that because I was watching your system on how you, you know, the, the catch a liar, the different signs. Obviously, the, you said there's nothing that's undisputable. There's not an undisputable way of right. catching a lie, but there's a system for it. But, sure. you know, you don't become an FBI agent because uh, uh, you just wake up one day, become an FBI agent. At least I don't think maybe that was the case with you. Typically, there's got to be a reason to drive a story, family, upbringing, sports, you know, uh, correcting an injustice. Tell us your story from where you were at to becoming an FBI agent. Well, that's pretty, pretty insightful on your part there, because there are at least two injustices that I think I tried to correct. Um, and becoming an FBI agent helped me do that. Uh, but when I was a kid, uh, just a toddler, I was always exploring things. I remember I asked my mother how the clock in the kitchen works. And she said, well, you plug it in and the electricity makes it move. And I was like, no, I mean, how do the hands know how fast to go? So I couldn't reach the one in the kitchen, but I could stand on a chair and grab the cuckoo clock in the living room. And I got a pair of pliers and a screwdriver and I, and I opened up the back of it. I took out all the gears and figured out why the one arm went faster than the other. And of course, my mother found me with the whole thing all disassembled on the living room floor. And she let out a scream because it was a family heirloom. And I carefully put it all back together. And to me, that kind of sense of exploration, it want, I wanted to be a detective. I wanted to figure things out. But then I became a chemistry major in college, chemistry and philosophy, then went to law school. And I thought, well, joining the police department would kind of be taking a step backwards. I couldn't just walk in to become a detective. And so I became a prosecutor. And that was very fulfilling, very busy work. But then I, I kind of had this thing in the back of my head. My grandfather was killed by the mob. He owned a construction company in, in New York City. He wasn't playing their games. And he ended up getting accidentally electrocuted on this on the site and a month later his son who took over the company my my cousin my excuse me my uncle guy he was also killed in an accidental bulldozer accident and my father actually went to law school on the GI bill to sue to get the company back and 
by the time he did, these uh, sort of mob union guys had taken over, sold off all the assets, and he got you know pennies for this company that was actually doing millions of dollars of work. They they built the Manhattan County Courthouse, a bunch of buildings on Fordham, Columbia, Columbia Law School, and uh, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. You know they were doing major jobs, and and it was gone. So my father had to start from scratch. So I think that that sense of injustice ingrained in myself and my brother Tim uh, a desire to actually make sure justice happens for other people and the other thing was that my brother Peter gave me a call and said look now that you're a prosecutor we should do something about that the director of the camp when we were kids and I said whoa why and he said because I once snuck into his office and I found hundreds of pictures of him molesting boys. And I said, I thought I was the only one. And so the next day I went to the FBI and YPD task force on sexual exploitation of children. We started a case and I went undercover. I met with the guy, I wore a wire and uh, we, we locked up the guy and he had been responsible for somewhere between 50 and 200 victims over the course of his career. He was, he worked for the Catholic church. He taught in 23, excuse me, he taught in 13 different Catholic schools over 23 years. Every time there was an allegation, they let him walk out the door and go down the street to another school. And so correcting that injustice ended up with the agent pushing over an application to me at the end of the trial and saying, you should join the FBI. You did an amazing job on this case. And literally, that's how I became an FBI agent. So it was a sense of correcting injustice, and it helped me turn something that was very difficult in my life into something very positive. By helping victims get through the same kind of thing or very different things, it made me feel better about the experience I had in my life. So you said Peter called, not Tim, right? So Peter's the one that's not the FBI agent that called to you when you were a prosecutor saying, let's go after that director. Did he know the story with you and the director, or he did not? Not until he made that call. I never told anyone. Okay, well, so he, I did he tell knew... the priest at my school who told me, I absolve you of your sins, say nothing more about this. Years later, I would be investigating that same priest who molested kids in my class. You got to be so, kidding me. No, I'm serious. And so, you know, there was a lot of stuff that happened that uh, I felt really set me on a course to try to correct things rather than let them exist as they now, were. Now, Jim, you're from uh, San Mateo, California, but you're from New York. You're New- yes. Yeah. What's, what, Clemente, what kind of a, what nationality is your family, mom and dad? Uh, well, mom was actually Scotch-Irish and my father was Italian. So I'm about, when I did 23 and Me, it's like basically 49.2% Italian, 49.4% Irish. So I'm about Half and half there. So they told you the truth. You see, when I did mine on Ancestry, uh, I, I was told I'm half Assyrian, half Armenian, but I'm 18 percent Italian and I still can't figure out who hooked up with an Italian. So that's a mystery <laughs> in our family. Mom and dad won't tell me anything. Uh, so It could have been. Yeah, it could have been something way, way, way back in history. It, it probably knows. was. I mean, listen, I wouldn't be surprised because Italians are pretty smooth. And uh, somebody was probably a smooth talker. But but are you, you still go. a cath? Are you still a Catholic yourself, or no? I actually separated from the church. I I was pretty disgusted by how they handled things. Not I mean I'm only giving you the scratching of the surface. Sure, but sure. I I did when I joined the FBI. They assigned me to the very task force, the Sexual Exploitation of Children Task Force in New York City. It was an NYPD FBI joint task force. I worked that task force for several years and. While I was there, unfortunately, I came into contact with a number of other situations in which the Catholic Church had literally chosen to brush things under the rug rather than address the victimization of children. And I couldn't stand for that. Yeah, I I just wonder, because when a story like that happens dramatically, you can't, uh, you know, it's it's, uh, pretty tough to go back to no matter how much people try to explain it to you, like, listen, this is a life changing. Anyways, okay, sounds good. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, with myself and the audience. So uh, now that we know that, let's get right into your world of being an FBI agent. So if you don't mind taking a minute, you know, the the part, the way you explain it, I asked this question 
Who was I interviewing? The the crime uh, detective from UK, uh, uh, Paul Paul Milleri. Yeah. Paul Milleri. Yeah, from UK. Who his job was to go interview these guys and find out what it is. And I asked him the question about nature versus nurture, because mm-hmm. you know sometimes you're in school. We had this one kid who was six years old who liked to throw dogs out the window from fourth floor, and he like. You got to have something off to do that at six years old. And he was always a little weird, right, when he would do certain things. So explain the nurture versus nature of somebody who is born, who eventually ends up becoming a murderer, or committing major crimes of taking someone's life. Is it nurture? Is it nature? Well, um, I think people are, are skipping a very important component when you talk about nature versus nurture. It's actually a combination of bio, psycho, and social. So you have a certain propensity or potentiality with your genetics. You're born with the abilities to do certain things and the inabilities to do other things. But your psychology and your personality are the filter through which you experience life. So your socialization is actually filtered through your psychology and personality. And then your personality is actually made through the millions of little private decisions you make in your own brain. So that's how you affect how life affects you. And so the way I like to summarize it is genetics loads the gun, personality and psychology aims it, and your experiences pull the trigger. So unless you have that perfect storm of all three aspects, you won't get somebody who's going to go out and kill. Somebody, you know, they've done twin studies where, where one twin who's got the same genetics, identical twins, is in, a, is in a difficult situation. And his parents are suffering and they're s- sacrificing and they're not even getting enough food, right? Because they're feeding their kids. And that one kid says, I, I love my parents. I, 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 I see how they suffer for me. When I grow up, I want to make sure they want for nothing. I want to take care of them. And the other twin says, are you kidding me? They don't even give us what we deserve. We deserve better. They're failures. I hate them. And that's the same genetics. But the decisions that the one twin made in his own mind, instead of pushing away from the dark side, he embraces it. And that's the negative spin he puts on everything he experiences. And I think that's why you get people who ultimately go down the road of being a killer or a serial killer or a rapist or a serial rapist, because they made these tiny little decisions in their brains that they're more important than other people. So, so okay, so I like the way you put it. You said uh, genetics loads the gun, personality and psychology aims it but then your experiences pulls the trigger, right? So, okay, so now let's, we just had the uh, Kyle Rittenhouse uh, uh, case, by the way, 10 minutes before we did the interview, I'm sure you saw that uh, being yeah. in the world, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. So what is it in his case, okay? So that's a current event that right now everybody around the world is talking about. Absolutely. What, how would you uh, classify his case? Well, to me, the, the, some of the, the circumstances that came out in the trial that people didn't know beforehand, the fact is that he did not purchase that weapon. He had a friend purchase it, but he couldn't wait to get his hands on it. He wanted to feel more powerful. He felt helpless and he wanted something that was gonna give him that power. And then the the riots and the uprising and the protests gave him the opportunity to be called upon, to be powerful with this weapon. And so this is why we don't give guns to 17 year olds. This is why we have rules. You can't buy it until you're 18. Now, if it's supervised with an adult, you can operate one earlier if you know how to do it and you can do it safely. But he did not have those circumstances. But in this case, because of the way the trial fell out, because of the way the evidence was or wasn't turned over, some of these things were not given to the jury. And and the charges of him illegally possessing a weapon were dropped by the judge, they were, they were thrown out. And that sort of undermined the entire case. But if you look at it behaviorally, this is a young man now who was a boy at the time, a teenager who felt powerless and that weapon in his hand gave him power. 
So what did he do? He went out to basically exercise that power in a situation where he felt justified to do it. So in his brain, he said, and and there was actually quotes of him saying, watching protests earlier on and violence earlier on saying, oh, man, I wish I had my gun. Right. This is something that he had thought about a long time, but he put himself in that opportunity so that he could use that gun. And no matter what somebody else did, I believe that this is something that he was destined to do. He wanted to do this. His personality drove him to be in a position where he could pull that trigger. And that was an irresponsible thing at the very least for him to do. I believe that that he went out there because he wanted to actually exercise that power. And unfortunately, it ended in the death of two people, a serious injury to a third. I don't know all the facts and circumstances because obviously I wasn't there. So I don't know if this jury's verdict was was proper or not. But I do know there are going to be people that are very displeased with it, thinking that it was literally just because of biases. Unfortunately, I think what it was was because of the legal way the the legalities and the laws and how they are enforced in that particular state. I don't believe that the jury got it wrong. I think that unfortunately the case fell apart because of when and how the evidence was presented. Yeah, it's it, by the way when you said he was destined, do you think in his mind he was doing the right thing and he was being a hero? Or do you think it is more, and again, everything you say, it's, it's nothing is undisputable. The word you say, everything is sure. possi- possibly, right? But do you think in his mind is like, look, I'm sick and tired of seeing all these protesting and what they're doing to the business. I'm going to go be a hero and I'm going to be the next, uh, you know, William Wallace. I'm going to be a protector. I'm going to be, you know, this guy from this movie. W- Absolutely. What, okay, so you think Absolutely. he's coming from I a hero that. standpoint. Okay. Uh, and the only question that remains is what was in his heart? What was in his mind in terms of bias? Is it something that he gets all fired up about this because he is a biased person or is it not? I mean, many people thought that the people that he killed and shot were actually African-Americans, but they weren't. They, they were, not. were yeah. white people. Yeah. Right. They were white people who were advocating for Black Lives Matter. And and unfortunately, got involved in in violence. I do not believe at all that violence was something that had to happen on either side of that. It's an unfortunate choice that people made. And unfortunately, when you have mob violence, people do a lot worse than they do on their own, than they would ever do on their own. And that's part of people's personalities and going along. And this is all behavior that we've documented throughout history. You know, to me, this, this, this. Uh, obviously, we can take a different angles. One guy brought up the politics side. I said, listen, if this guy's, uh, if you're thinking this is political, the judge that said not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, based on what the jury said, the judge was appointed by Obama. So the, it can't be political. This is a, you know, of course yeah. they want to make it political. Don't get me wrong. The state is worried. 500 National Guards. You've read it. I've read it. We know the stories about how worried they are about what could potentially happen there. But all I think about in a situation like this is how we can improve as a society, not how to work backwards. So, you know, as a parent, your, your parents would say, you know, nothing good happens after midnight. You know, those stories are like, Mom, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to an after hour, so four o'clock in the morning, you know, and then one instance you go to a club and there's shooting, you know, a guy gets shot, one of your friends gets shot. You're like, you know what, man, half these things parents tell you when you were a kid about not going to these places is right. So, you know, even getting yourself caught up to go get in a protesting like that, a riot to support something that turns ugly, you're one foolish decision away from ruining your life. So I I couldn't agree with you more. And unfortunately, as I said, it's it's the kind of thing where it's sort of a snowball effect. I mean, once he went out there with the intent to to sort of assert this new power that he had with this gun, uh, this kind of thing was inevitable, I think, for him. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I wonder how much of that has to do with the steering of the pot, whether what was going on with the politics at the time, the left, the right, the media, who knows? But all I know is it led to two people not being here right now. So whether it's guilty or not guilty, that family is still going to be mourning about the loss of to their kids, brother, yeah. you know, whoever that, you know, the, the connection it is to the family. But, okay, so let's process that from a logical standpoint. 
Is there any way, uh, based on these three things we're talking about, genetics loads the gun, great. Mass is pretty cool. I got a gun. I'm powerful, right? You know, mm -hmm. personality and psychology aims, all right? And then you got the experience that's like, I'm going to pull the trigger. You know, like the, the, what's that one movie where you prevent a crime from happening before it happens with Tom Cruise? What was the name of that movie? It's not Born Identity. It's not the... Uh, 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 anyways, there was a movie that he did. Something effect, right? Uh, I'm trying to get the movie here when you, when you, when I ask a question from you. What technology or data, predictive analytics, is the FBI currently working on to be able to get to the point of one of these things not triggering the last one? If that makes any it's sense. A, yeah, it's funny you mention that. Uh, so when I. When I was in the behavioral analysis unit, uh, which is part of the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime, we were doing a number of different research projects, um, everything from parents who kill their kids to people who attack the elderly uh, to serial killers and sex offenders. All of those studies were going on simultaneously. The whole purpose of that is to look at behavior to try to find points of intervention. In the Rittenhouse case, the point of intervention is would have been preventing him from getting that weapon until he was developmentally mature enough to actually hold it and use it, and not like a child would. Unfortunately, because he was young, I think this is why. I mean, there were lots of other people out there with the same kind of weapons who didn't kill anybody that night, right? So what is the difference? I think it was his development developmental immaturity and that could have been stopped i don't know by parents or some other adult that was in that uh, sort of circle of influence around him someone who heard him say uh i can't i wish i had my gun and and intervened at that point and said wait a minute that's not the answer here that's only going to escalate the violence we need to de-escalate the violence and it's like when I went to Guantanamo uh, and, and I, was, I was tasked with evaluating their interrogation program and I discovered that they were torturing people and put a stop to it. it, it I, I, I was horrified, one, because they're, they're literally hurting defenseless people. I don't care what they did in the past. They are now shackled. They are in U.S. custody and they're being tortured. That is not right from a human standpoint, but it's also wrong from a standpoint of getting accurate and reliable information. So I taught them how to do rapport-based interrogation. And I think rapport-based intervention in the Kyle Rittenhouse case could have prevented him from being out there that night with his weapon, with the weapon that was not legally purchased for him, that he was not allowed to possess yet because he wasn't yet 18 that I think that rapport-based intervention could have helped him avoid that situation. So I, I want to get into that, but before getting into that, by the way, the movie was called Minority Report, is what go, the movie right. was. And, and I watched the movie in regards to uh, Guantanamo Bay, which they did a great job, by the way. The Maurit Mauritanian, I don't know how to pronounce the word. I don't know if you saw the movie or not. It's uh, uh, Mauritanian? Yes. I'm not sure. I saw the report. I I saw that one. Yeah, this one here, I think you got to watch this one as well because it's based on the true story of uh, Mohammed Aoud uh, Salahi who was held there for 14 years and tortured. And it's a very painful movie to watch, but they do a great job depicting what happened uh, with well, the event. Well, I'm not allowed to talk about the particular people that were involved, but uh, I, I'm pretty certain I know what happened behind the scenes in that movie. Yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure you do. That's why I brought it up. So. Uh, so going back to what you said, so report-based intervention. Rapport-based. So, rapport, sorry. sorry, rapport, like building rapport, you know, tell me about yes. yourself, tell me about upbringing. So walk me through the torture base. Is torture base pretty much what we think it is, uh, where, you know, pain, anything they can to eventually get this person to say yes? And then is rapport base taking a little bit more time to build a relationship? Can you give us the differentiation yeah, sure. from your you, point of I'll view? I'll give you the, the, the both sides of it. So the the program that they were implementing, it, it was called Fear Up, Person Down. All right. So they wanted to scare these people and and remove them, their humanity from them, basically. 
They were humiliating them. They were confusing them. They were keeping them up all night. They were shining bright lights in their face. They were playing loud music. They were having guard dogs. They were doing all sorts of, of very cruel things. And then it just escalated as time went on to worse and worse things. And, and what that does, especially with people who have lived a, a tough and hardened life, is reinforce that the people who are doing this to you are the same ones who made your life and your family's life and your grandfather's life miserable. So it hardens them in their own goals. It does not undermine their expectations like rapport-based interrogation does. What happens is they come, they come to this situation and they expect to be treated horribly by the monsters that have created this in their mind because this is how they were trained, this is how they were recruited. These monsters from America, they caused all this pain and suffering in your life and your family's life. So the torture only reinforces that. But if you give them dignity and respect and share a human connection, that bridge that you build with them by sharing something with yourself from yourself and asking and being sincere about inquiring about their lives and their faith and their culture. By doing that, it shows them that you're a human being just like they are. And that connection is a, is a hell of a lot stronger than anything you'll ever build by hurting someone. So what it is, is it undermines their expectations. They now don't understand, wait a minute, uh, I thought all these people were evil and monsters. Why is this person being nice to me? And then they start saying, well, maybe, maybe what I found out before wasn't true. What I found out now is true. And you have an opportunity there to actually build a connection and get people to cooperate rather than to firm their resolve to kill you, to destroy your society, to destroy your faith. So I, what I did was I asked them to give me their worst detainee, the one that was hardened the most and that would not at all cooperate. And he was actually a Hafiz. So he, he memorized the Quran. And anytime anybody tried to interrogate him, he would just quietly whisper the Quran to himself. And he was in another world. He never even acknowledged another person. And in the, over the course of 11 days, I met with him, I gave him dignity and respect. I treated him like a human being. I gave him control over when and how we met. And I, I told him, I'm here, I'm a behavioral analyst. I'm stuck here for months. I would love to take the opportunity to, to learn about your faith and your culture and you as a person. And slowly I revealed things about myself and eventually he revealed things about himself. And at the end, he said, Jim, my friend, what can I do for you? And he began to cooperate with us fully. And that was to demonstrate how the process works. It takes a little more time, maybe, but it actually is effective at getting accurate and reliable information. And it doesn't perpetuate the, the horror stories that they've learned growing up about us it actually helps them understand us. Uh, Jim, how much of this is, uh, are you a sports guy or no? Uh, somewhat, but you know, I, I, I like play, it, playing sports rather than just watching it on TV. Are you a Giants but, fan? Are you a Jets fan? Are you a Knicks fan? Are you a Yankees fan? Look, it, the only team ever is the Yankees. I'm okay. sorry. All right. So fair enough. I mean, you sound like you'd be a Yankees guy. Forget so, about it, yeah. So, so, so go with the Yankees, you know. So you know how some in baseball, uh, there's different philosophies to win a World Series. The Braves, for the longest time in the 90s, they had a strong pitching uh, uh, philosophy, right? And they had these all these Kevin Millwood. They had John Smoltz, Glavin. Uh, I'm forgetting the main guy, Greg Maddox. They had all these guys, right? And they won one, but they were always the best team in the league, right? You go to the Yankees, the way they do. They wait for guys to go to other teams, and they come and overpay them and bring them to the Yankees and dominate the marketplace, Right. You look yeah. at the Tampa Bay Devil Rays recently where it's the pitchers pitch three innings instead of five or complete games. You don't have a lot of complete games. How much of this is fear up, person down versus rapport 
based interve- intervention, how much of it is philosophy versus results? Meaning this is how we get our results. This is how you do it versus no. Report base is more effective than fear up, person down. Because I had friends who were in, in, in Delta and I had friends who were dealt with those guys directly. So to them, you know, they've seen how they were. What would you say to somebody that says, it's easy for him to say, we deal with these guys. They're not as nice as Jim makes it out to be. What would you say to those folks? Well, I would say there, there are different sets of exigencies in different circumstances. If you're in a battlefield and somebody has information about 500 people who are about to be killed, there are ways that military people deal with those people. That is not an in-custody interrogation situation. Here's the thing. In the FBI, we have always used constitutionally approved grounds for interrogation. It's a, diff- it's a more difficult route to take, but it has proven over 100 years that we can actually get people who are just as bad as any terrorist, serial killers, people who have taken the lives of, of elderly people, people, innocent people in their own home, children. They have viciously killed them, but we've gotten them to cooperate and actually admit what they did wrong. And how did we do that? Again, by building a bridge, a human bridge, because no matter how hard that terrorist is or that battle combatant is, they're still a human being. And if you can get to that humanity and make a connection, then the chances of you getting reliable and accurate information are much greater. And that's that's the the, the strictures under which all FBI agents and law enforcement officers operate. Military people are in a different world. And I don't know that world as well. I don't know if it actually produces on in the moment um, accurate and reliable information. But I know that it's illegal for anybody to do that to somebody when they're in custody. And I know that the the torture statute in the United States is very clear about it. Well, you know, the Geneva Convention, they're, they're, uh, the code amongst how you're supposed to treat a POW is a pretty clear code amongst everybody that follows yes. it. But, but you and I know what happens. The, the, the part that made it interesting with Paul Mallory, the guy from UK, who his job is to go sit down and talk to these guys that just apparently killed somebody and they're potentially the suspect, is he says in UK the law is I have 36 hours. So I have to try to get information in 36 hours. In your world, you have time on your side. So maybe you're like, look, I'm going to be here for six months. I don't really have any other place to go. Tell me a little yeah. bit more about the Quran. What a, I can see that because you're getting me to sit down and say, you know what? Shit, this, ah, I like this guy, man. Listen, here's really what happened. You know, da, 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 da. Right, uh, but uh, when I when I gave you that example, I mean, the, the, this is a this is a a person who was in custody for quite a bit of time, who had been treated badly already, and so I had to sort of undo all the damage that was done. But when we're talking about a law enforcement interrogation, even of serial killers, generally we say you know spend at least four hours with the person. But I'm talking about when we're when you're in that situation generally it happens within 4 to 6 to 8 hours it's not something that takes days it's literally the ability of someone to be you know human to another person and to show that there is a way to help you through the situation and it has to be based on that person's personality so what we want to do is assess that And certain people who are very narcissistic, you have to feed their ego. Certain people who are very sort of their vulnerable narcissists. In other words, they puff out their chest because they feel so badly about themselves. So you want to help them feel better. And so, again, you read each individual and you look at their own personality and psychology and and you learn that through their behavior. And then you use that and you try to make... uh, a bridge so that they feel comfortable coming over to your side rather than being bullied or forced over. Yeah, I almost feel like this. So, so, 
I almost feel like this person that can probably get the most out of uh, the, the case has to be as unemotion, emotionally disattached from the situation as possible that you bring from the outside. They can sit down and talk to them because if you're emotionally attached to the situation, you're not going to be able to uh, handle the situation properly. So it's probably not the job of everybody either. I think it takes the right personality yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah, we call it a clinical detachment, just like a surgeon focuses only on the area that yeah. they're that they're doing surgery on. But but actually, emotion could be an important component of it. It's just that you can't carry the negative emotion into it. What you have to do is separate your own feelings about whatever they did yeah. and look at it clinically. But then you also have to be willing to be very emotional with someone. Sometimes it's literally making a connection, putting your hand on their shoulder, on their knee, telling them, look at me, I'm, I'm serious. This is your opportunity to help yourself. This is your opportunity to come clean. This is your opportunity to not be haunted by this for the rest of your life. Whatever is the best approach, because you really want them to get get to a point where they will tell you the truth. And that's your that's your ultimate goal. The last thing you want somebody to do is tell you something that isn't true because they want the pain to stop. That's right. That's right. So to just kind of a. Uh... You know, uh, and we've seen that happen. In, it happens in relationships. It happens in, you know, kids with their parent relationship, boss, employee relation. It happens everywhere. But let's let's go back to uh, what I brought up earlier when you said uh, snipers have a God complex. So can you unpack that? What do you mean when you say snipers have a God complex? Whenever we at, at the behavioral analysis unit look at a crime, at a series of crimes, we reverse engineer back to the type of person who committed that crime. So. Basically, in the case of snipers, the choice, the weapon choice is one of distance. Uh, the whole point is that there is no physical connection between the offender and the victim in a sniper case. And the sniper chooses to take life from above and afar. And that's very godlike. Whereas there are other offenders who want to get up close and personal, manual strangulation, stabbing, those things are, are sort of in your face and that it requires a different type of personality. And generally, people choose to snipe versus actually one on one contact with their victims because they feel they want to feel omnipotent. They want to feel powerful. And in this case, so, so for example, if if you look at the D.C. sniper case, one of the major issues in that case was that there was a dichotomy between how this person planned and executed shootings flawlessly and how they communicated to us through written, the written word. And Jim Fitzgerald, who was sitting next to me in the, in the BAU, said everybody was talking about in this sniper case how this guy – Six times within 27 hours, one shot, one kill. He was in and out. He, there was no decompensation. There was no adrenaline rush that made him make mistakes. He was a ghost. And everybody said he's got to be older, settled, police or military trained, and have police or military experience because it's not as easy to pull the trigger on human beings as it is on paper targets. And so – Everybody was agreeing to that. But then Jim Fitzgerald said, yeah, but if you look at this tarot card and this letter that they left us, it says this is for you, Mr. Police. And that told Fitzgerald that that the writer was looking up to the police, not like from a powerful position, omnipotent yeah. position, but from below. And he Mr. Police is a, is a common phrase in in reggae songs in the Caribbean. And so he felt there was a Caribbean influence here and that the person was younger. And even one of the one of the communications had those little stars that you put on a kindergartner's paper or picture. And like, what the hell? What kind of a sophisticated 45 year old is going to put that on a communication to the cops? So Fitz says if he's an adult, he's barely an adult, but he's more likely 15 or 16. And everybody just blew up at that. And I said. Look then either 
this guy is incredibly poised and sophisticated when he plans and executes his shootings, but he decompensates when he's communicating to us or for the first time in U.S. history, we have a sniper team. And the rest of the people say, what are you crazy? Snipers have a God complex. They don't work well together. They've never done it in the history of U.S. crime. Why would this happen now? And I said, well, you could do it if one of them's 45 and one of them's 15. And this one is controlling that one, the younger one. And if he's controlling him completely, he may be sexually victimizing him to do that. And everybody said, well, you're an expert in that field. So that's why, you know, you, you got a hammer. Everything case, looks like yeah. a nail to you. Yeah. You're just superimposing that. Well, it turned out about 10 or 11 years later, Malvo came out and said almost from day one that Muhammad had been sexually victimizing him. And so those things, those behaviors leaked out information that they didn't intend to give us. So we put that into the profile that they were African-American and one was 45 and one was 15 and that they would probably have a Caribbean influence in their life. And and within 24 hours, they were arrested. Now, we we go through that in 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 a audible original series that we created, Call Me God, where my brother and I tell our different stories because we both, Tim and I, worked that case together. We were sort of off the grid because we weren't supposed to be working the case, but these shootings happened in our own neighborhood and we couldn't let it go. Tim's wife was at the, the same gas pump that one of the victims was shot at 10, 10 minutes later. That's how close to home it was. So these cases sometimes, uh, you can't avoid working them. You know, they, you're drawn into them. And Tim and I had a very different way of looking at it. He was out with, he's a sniper. He knows snipers. He was out hunting with his SWAT team, looking for opportunities where they might strike nets. And he was one mile away from the Home Depot when an actual FBI employee was shot and killed at that Home Depot. He was the first law enforcement officer to arrive at that scene. And we were very early on the scene in the, in the Fredericksburg shooting uh, situations because that's where we lived at the time. So the fact is that the behavior that these offenders exhibited told us that for the first time in U.S. history, we had a sniper team. They had a God complex. Muhammad certainly had a God complex, and he was trying to ingrain that into Malvo. But Malvo would never have been involved in that level of violence had it not been for Muhammad basically forcing him into it. What a technical case, though. I mean, how, how does one make those two connections with a 45-year-old and a teen because you're getting a feel of both when they communicate doesn't... Uh, I mean, that... that uh, it, it's funny because Tim found the found the letter at one of the shooting scenes in Ashland, Virginia. And that letter gave me and Jim Fitzgerald and the rest of my team the information. I mean, it leaked out information. That's what behavior does. That's They call us in, not when there's you know plenty of DNA and blood evidence and the weapons found at the scene uh, are a video of the offender exists. They call us in where there's nothing. And we take the behavior, and as I said, we reverse engineer back to the type of person who committed the crime. There's so many things. So in that case, victim choice. They were random victims. Again, that goes along with the God complex. It's not like he had a connection with these victims. He just wanted to take life indiscriminately. And that, again, that gave us more and more information about him every time he pulled the trigger. We learned more about him and his behavior. And every time he communicated with us, which we always try to encourage, they act absolutely give much more information than they think. F fascinating. The, 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 there's, a re there's a community that doesn't like FBI agents, especially the last five years, because you guys got a black eye the last five years. But there is a need for what you guys do. The right agents are extremely necessary because these are things that regular people on a day to day basis to put the connect the dots like that. It's a very tough thing to do. That's why you guys are professionals. Well, we're. We're, we're fortunate enough to have the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime to get to study crime, violent and sexual crime, 
24 hours a day, 365. And because of that, we get to share that information with law enforcement across the country and around the world. And that is a privilege and an honor. And I think if you look at the history of the FBI, yeah, there have been some ups and downs. And and the, the, the thing about the FBI, though, is generally it does not get involved in politics. The agents who work the investigations, uh, they do their job irrespective of what's going on in the country or who, what political party is there. Maybe some of the upper echelon people might be influenced by it, but certainly the people who are doing the investigations and putting their lives on the line. Those not, people not an easy job. doing it for the victims. Not an easy job, man. Not, it's not an easy job you guys got. So let's talk deception. Let's talk deception. So, okay. you know, people are always fascinated by telling whether somebody's lying or not. Like, I, I think there's even channels on YouTube where all they do is they sit there and they say, look when he did this, he's lying. Look when he went like this, he's lying. Look how he's trying to deceive you by making, doing everything you're supposed to do to act like he's nervous, but he's acting. He's not really like that. It's not really him. There's, there's, a, there's a business for that. There's books that are written about this because Absolutely. people want to know this. So obviously you've said it. There is nothing that's disputable. Like there's no, you know, but for no the most indisputable, part, indisputable, yeah. unique thing that can tell you somebody is lying. You have to norm that person. It's all individual. You have to norm people, that person. Wow. Yeah. It's people have their own idiosyncrasies. Yeah. And some people are very nervous in general and they get totally calm when they're lying. Some people are looking all over the place and they'll look right in your eyes when they're lying. There's there's a whole bunch of different theories that we use. We blend them together in the FBI. We don't use one theory, but there's fight or flight because when people get really nervous, they'll get fidgety because their body is pumping blood and pumping adrenaline to their extremities. So sometimes they'll fidget or their hands will go all over the place. They'll, they'll fix their hair. They'll, they'll adjust themselves, whatever it is. But that is only one aspect that you look at. You have to spend time. I told you earlier when we're doing interrogations, we tell people the minimum you should spend is four hours because the chances of you getting an accurate and reliable confession increase 25% with each hour that you spend. And those four hours should be spent <laughs> learning about that person, getting as much information about them and their behavior wow. as possible. Because then when you put the hard questions to them, then you, after having taken in all this information about the person, then you will be able to notice the changes in their behavior. And those changes are the red flags. Those are the areas that you want to dive into further. But again, a lot of people say micro expressions are absolutely a tell. Well, in some cases they are, in some cases they are not. Um, the more intelligent a person is, the more micro expressions they'll have. The lesser intelligent people sometimes will, will have no facial indications at all that they're lying. They, they, their facial expressions don't give away much at all, but their behaviors or the words or their language or how they use certain words or the changes in words. It's a very complicated thing. I used to teach deception detection at the FBI Academy. Uh, believe me, it's, it's a months long course. It's not something I can just summarize in one day, but I will tell you this in the FBI, we actually believe that if people if people are lying to you that there are going to be indications that they are lying but you have to understand that individual person before you can ever hope to know if any person is actually lying i love the four hour rule every hour 25 percent goes up you need four to get to the norm the more intelligent the more signs they'll give you, the less intelligent, the less signs they'll give you. Uh, uh, just out of curiosity. And they, and they may do impression management. The intelligent people will give you what they think you expect from a truthful person. And that might be looking right into your eyes when at the very point when they're lying. And that you have to see that that's a change in their behavior. Why did he stare in my eyes that time? But all this other time, he's telling me about his favorite team, where he goes to work, how he drives to work, you know, what he drinks at night. 
all these things. And he's just looking all over the place. But when he said he wasn't there on the fourth, he was looking straight in my eye. <laughs> now, most people believe that gaze aversion, looking away, is an indicator of lying. When in that case, it could be looking at you is the indicator. So if you didn't norm that person, you would never know it. And you would think he's lying about the wrong things. But another really important thing to prevent false confessions is to make sure that you never just take it at face value. You see indications of lying and you you dive in, but the person could be lying about something totally different. In other words, they they don't want to give you the ap- actual alibi because they were having an affair with someone. And they can't say I was at this motel with so-and-so because even in a homicide investigation, the last thing they want is their wife's anger. They don't want to be called out on the affair. So they're, they're lying about something, but it's not the homicide that you're investigating. So you have to be incredibly careful once you get indicators of deception, yeah. those are the areas you have to dive deeper into and get more details out. That's insane to go. Uh, look, how, how important you think it is uh, uh, the president Americans choose every four to eight years? How important do I how think that is? How important of a decision is that for us? I think it's a ping pong match. <laughs> I think it's a pendulum <laughs> swing. God. I think in the United States of America, we haven't yet figured out that middle of the road is the best way to go rather than extreme here or extreme there. I would much rather see some coalition or something down the middle that didn't cause, you know, extreme changes these four or eight years. And then that's undone for the next four to eight years. Uh, it, It wastes money, it wastes time and it wastes people's livelihoods and people's lives and it weakens but it weakens the, the the foundation of what this country was founded on you know I, it does and i i do believe that if if people i mean there are some countries that have have tripartite coalitions so that everybody's represented i don't think that's a bad idea but you know it hasn't come here yet but let's let's face it politics comes and goes the things I'm talking about, the things that we're discussing here, these things have been developed over the last oh, hundred plus here's years. Here's where I was going with this question. Where I was going with this question was, you know, one time I did a, uh, a show, uh, you know, guys call me and they want to do debates. So one time I had uh, Alan Dershowitz, which I don't know if you know who he is. The, uh, of the, course uh, I do. Okay, so I had him debate Robert Kennedy. Robert's a g- good friend, so I had them two. Allen was saying if the government wants to mandate, they can, even though he disagrees, they can mandate. And uh, RFK is saying there's no way in the world they can mandate. These are both attorneys. One is the best environmental attorney. The other one is, you know, you know who Allen is. So then I had another guy that came and debated. Uh, uh, one was the director developmental from Normal, which they want to legalize marijuana everywhere. And the other one was a Christian uh, Navy uh, commander, and they came and they debated uh, marijuana. And on the bottom, every time somebody told a lie, we would just go, eh. Or if it was green, check with the facts below it, right? What do you think we can do? Do you think uh, presidential election 2023, we should have these guys lined up with lie detective tests, and every time they say something, you see a score behind them, and the audience is like, he's lying. She's lying. How do you think we can improve the debates? Well, unfortunately, the polygraph is actually a tool, not a be all and end all. Sure, it, do- sure. it itself doesn't actually tell if somebody's lying. I mean, there has to be a human being that interacts with it. There are a number of things. There are people that have these stress analyzers and voice stress analyzers and things like that. They, they think they can tell. Um, again, How there about are a truth people serum. Who, you, you, you like the truth serum? Yeah, no. But there, no. But there are people so who fail the, the polygraph tequila. because they're extremely honest, and they're very. They have this sort of ingrained in them this fear of of doing something wrong, and so they're very fidgety and and nervous, and they sweat a lot, and it and it gives the appearance on a polygraph of lying. There are other people who, when they're being asked the questions, will because this is the thing. Our conscious mind operates at about in thousands of a second. We can make decisions and movements in thousands of a second, but our subconscious mind operates in trillions of a second, 10 billion times faster. Wow. And so while we're being asked conscious questions, subconsciously we're saying, wow, I'm glad I didn't do that when I was a kid. 
and and that is what comes out in your body actions. And so your 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 brain can think about things so much faster than your mouth can answer questions. Yeah. And so that's something that the polygraph doesn't do yet. Now they'll eventually come up with brain scans that are that are that are showing really incredible detail and I know they have some of that going on now. I think technology will eventually get a lot better at lie detecting, but you have to always understand human beings make decisions in the privacy of their brain. And those decisions can affect how they outwardly express truth and lies. And when you know somebody best, you, I'm sure you have children. When one of your kids, a teenager comes home late and they say, you say, where were you? It will take you a fraction of a second, maybe a thousandth of a second to tell whether they're telling the truth or a lie. Why? Because you made that person, you know that person intimately, you know everything about how they re respond to you. If law enforcement officers can get, get that level of detail when they're interrogating somebody, they'll never have a problem telling whether somebody's telling the truth or a lie. Unfortunately, they have to do it in a much more compressed way. So preparation for any interview or interrogation is what's critical. Knowing that person, knowing as much about them as possible and drawing out as much more in the time you spend with them, those are the keys to actually getting truthful confessions. So here's what I want to do. Since we have you on, I, I want the audience to see your uh, ability, your gift, what you see that we don't see. I want us to profile somebody, okay? Okay. And I was trying to have the guys pull up which one we were going to do. I can't use a clip from another channel. It has to be like a C-SPAN type of a thing where... You know, it's it's uh, what do you call it? It's not uh, CNN or MSNBC or Fox because we can commentate on it. I found a recent one from two weeks ago, and I'm curious to know what you say about this one here. And, and I'll play it. Whatever comments you got on it, you tell us. Now, in this exchange to preface before the audience sees it, you know, uh, uh, Fauci gain of function. Rand Paul is calling him out with NIH, all this stuff. The only feedback I want to get from you is when they're going back. Whatever feedback you give us is great. But Fauci's reaction and Rand Paul's reaction, and it will just listen to you. So I'm going to press play. Okay, here. Well, we'll see. Hopefully I can get something. I don't something. expect you today to admit that you approved of NIH funding for gain-of-function research in Wuhan. But your repeated denials have worn thin, and a majority of Americans, frankly, don't believe you. Even the NIH now admits that EcoHealth Alliance did perform experiments in Wuhan that created viruses not found in nature, that actually did gain in lethality. The facts are clear. The NIH did fund gain-of-function research in Wuhan, despite your protestations. You can deny it all you want, but even the Chinese authors of the paper, in their paper, admit that viruses not found in nature were created, and yes, they gained in infectivity. Your persistent denials, though, are not simply a stain on your reputation, but are a clear and present danger to the country and to the world. As Professor Kevin Esfeldt of MIT has written, gain-of-function research looks like a gamble that civilization can't afford to risk. And yet here we are again with you steadfast in your denials. Why does it matter? Because gain-of-function research with laboratory-created viruses not found in nature could cause a pandemic even worse the next time. We're suffering today from one that has a mortality of approximately 1%. They're experimenting with viruses that have mortalities of between 15 and 50 percent. Yes, our civilization could be at risk from one of these viruses. Experiments that combine unknown viruses with known pandemic-causing viruses are incredibly risky. Experiments that combine unknown viruses with coronaviruses that have as much as 50 percent mortality could endanger civilization as we know it. And here you sit unwilling to accept any responsibility for the current pandemic, and unwilling to take any steps to prevent gain-of-function research from possibly unleashing an even more deadly virus. You mislead the public by saying that the published viruses could not be COVID. Well, exactly no one is alleging that. No one is alleging that the published viruses by the Chinese are COVID. What we are saying is that this was risky type of research, gain-of-function research, it was risky to share this with the, Ch with the Chinese and that COVID may have been created from a not-yet-revealed virus. We don't anticipate the Chinese are going to reveal the virus if it came from their lab. You know that, but you continue to mislead. 
You continue to support NIH money going to Wuhan. You continue to say you trust the Chinese scientist. You appear to have learned nothing from this pandemic. Will you today finally take some responsibility for funding gain-of-function research in Wuhan? Senator, with all due respect, I disagree with so many of the things that you've said. Gain, first of all, gain-of-function is a very nebulous term. We have spent, not us, but outside bodies, a considerable amount of effort to give a more precise definition to the type of research that is of concern that might lead to a dangerous situation. You are aware of that. That is called P3CO. We're aware that you deleted gain of function okay. from the NIH well, website. Well, I can get back to that in a moment if we have time. But let's get back to the operating framework and guide rails of which we operate under. And you have ignored them. The guidelines are very, very clear that you have to be dealing with a pathogen that clearly is shown and very likely to be highly transmissible in an uncontrollable way in humans and to have a high degree you of morbidity. And so how does it feel so far? He is very poised and calm and very focused. And what Senator Rand was doing was putting lots of words in his mouth. In other words, he was he was quoting Dr. Fauci over and over again. He was telling Dr. Fauci what Dr. Fauci has done bad. You know, he's 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 basically giving him all these kinds of negative things. The of course, we're only seeing we don't have a constant camera on him, which would have been nice. But we're seeing cutbacks to Dr. Fauci and and he's basically placid. Yeah, there, even the breathing he, when he answered at first, I don't know if you caught that his breathing was a little bit. Let me go back to it. I wonder what that means, yeah. because these guys are he's getting ready. Yeah, he he's definitely getting ready to to say something. I believe he's you're what you're seeing is controlled behavior. In other words, he probably wants to say, dude, you're lying to me. You are lying to the public. You know a lot more than what you're saying, but. Fauci has to be composed. He has to be professional. If he if he gets in Senator's face, he's going to look disrespectful and it's going to be used against him. So I think what he was trying to do was, OK, I'm just going to try to give this in a measured, professional way and not respond negatively to all the very bad things that you've just claimed about me. So nothing so far seems suspicious from Fauci's side to you. Nothing, nothing that they've shown me. Okay. But again, I haven't been seeing him the whole time. But All right, let me go back to uh, let me go back to here. Like, what does this when he answers and he's like, take a look at this one here. Right. Senator, with all due respect, I disagree with so many of the things that you've said. Now, gain, first of all, gain of function. OK, so pause it there. Senator, so, with all due respect, I disagree you're dealing with, with somebody so who he had to take notes. He wrote down some notes yeah. so he could remember to make a particular point, because as he opens, there are so many things that you just said that I disagree with. So I think he wanted to make sure that he hit these particular points. So he moved the paper in front of him. There's nothing about I, I look at the totality of everything, not just how his hands move, how his eyes move, how his facial expressions change, because there isn't much in terms of facial expression change in here. And again, that's someone who is intelligent. That's someone who controls himself. He, he, he almost took a little, you know, sort of like a deep breath before you're about to sort of let loose, but you want to hold back. So, so let's go continue. Ahead. Let's see what we hear, let's see here next, because I'm going to go to this part. Hands that, hence the word E-P-P-P, enhanced pathogens of potemic, potemic, potential So when EcoHealth pandemic. Alliance took the now, virus, well, SHC014, I, I and combined it with WIV1 and caused a recombinant virus that doesn't exist in nature, and it made mice sicker, mice that had humanized cells, you're saying that that's not gain-of-function research? According to the framework... And guidelines. So what you're doing P3. is defining a way gain of function. No. You're simply saying it doesn't exist because you changed the definition on the NIH website. This is terrible, and you're you're completely trying to escape right. the idea that we should do something about trying to prevent a pandemic from leaking from a lab. There's the preponderance of evidence now points towards this coming from the lab, 
And what you've done is change the definition right. on your website to try to cover your ass, basically. That's what you've done. You've changed the website right. to try to have a new definition that doesn't include the risky research that's going on. Until you admit that it's risky, we're not going to get anywhere. You have to admit that this research was risky. The NIH has now rebuked them. Your own agency has rebuked them. But That's, the thing is, is you're still unwilling to admit that they gained in function when they say they became sicker. They gained in right. lethality. It's a right. new virus. That's not gain of function? According to the definition that is currently <laughs> operable, you know, Senator, the new let's one. make it clear for the people who are listening. The current definition was done over a two- to three-year period by outside bodies, including the NSABB, two conferences by the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine on December 2014, yeah. March 2016. We commissioned external risk-benefit assessment, and then on January of 2017, the Office of Science and Technology Policy of the White House issued the current policy. And coincidentally, I, I coincidentally have not changed the definition any definition. On the same day the NIH said that, yes, there was a gain of function in Wuhan, the same day the definition appeared, the new definition, to try to define away what's going on in Wuhan. Until you accept it, until you expect, accept responsibility, we're not going to get anywhere right. close to trying to prevent another lab leak of this dangerous sort of experiment. You won't admit well, that it's dangerous, and for that lack of judgment, I think it's time that you resign. Th thank you, Senator Paul, and I would like um, to give the time to Dr. Fauci. Yeah, well, uh, there were so many things I'll that I'll pause right here. I'll pause right here. here. I mean, he, this, is a, this is a man who's very frustrated by the circumstance. Dr. Fauci is not able to get the words out that he hoped to say, and he feels, it, he, you can see now his level of frustration has has removed some of his composure and he's trying now to actually get out the foundational statements that he believes will support his position rather than the senators it's a it's a very difficult situation i know for a fact that in situations like this there are many hearings that go on outside the uh the purview of the cameras that that people have done interviews beforehand and a lot of of what is said is it's it's a show it's like a trial there's admissible stuff and there's inadmissible stuff and unfortunately it's not an equally weighted situation the senator and sitting on the on the in the tall chairs uh has more power than than any witness that's going to be sitting uh in front of them so i can see the stress coming out in dr fauci here and again i i would be irresponsible to say that I know that that stress is because he's lying. Uh, the stress can be come, come from many different angles. Uh, I would like to spend more time with Fauci and get to know him and get to know what he's like under stress, as well as whether or not he, he um, is capable of, 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 of lying and being completely impervious to indicators of that, because it's a possibility, especially when somebody is, is intelligent. Clearly he is intelligent, but you don't see what, what you would generally see in, in a, in a person who, who's just panicking because they've been caught in a lot, quote, caught in a lot. Did he look like I, he was panicking a little bit? He looked like he was panicking a little bit to me. I don't know if no, they, Yeah, well, yeah. what I said was at the end, he was definitely, he definitely looked like he was stressed. But from what I've seen, and again, this is just my uh, observation from what I've seen, he was cut off in the middle of his explanation. He was, he, he resorted to reading the definition from a piece of paper because he did not want to... Um, get interrupted and not give that information out. It's a, like I said, it's just a, it's a very difficult situation to be in, but could he have uh, funded th th this? What was it called? Something gain, gain? gain of function, gain of function gain of is fun could he have fun could he have uh, knowingly funded gain of function research? And uh, like the center has said, they changed the definition in the process. Uh, it's, it's possible. I mean, it's, I wouldn't rule it out, 
But again, I, I don't feel like I have enough information to tell you that that is what he's getting stressed about. I can tell you he's getting stressed, but I can also come up with two different possibilities of why he's stressed. Yeah. Because you know, of the situation or because he's lying. You know, the, the, the challenge is, you know, uh, at first when they introduced this guy, I mean, nobody knew him except for the people that studied it. You know, they knew he was part of the AIDS pandemic back in the 80s and, you know, uh, uh, where he has been around. He's been doing this for a while. Then all of a sudden it's like the trust in the guy keeps going lower. Then one day John Stewart comes out on uh, Stephen Colbert's show and he says, look, why can't we go investigate the fact that uh, this was man-made or not in China? Why is that such a no-no? Why can't we talk about it? And that caused a big frenzy in the media where everybody started talking and saying, maybe we ought to find out because the world stopped. Let's face it, a lot of kids didn't go to school. They were homeschooling. We don't know the residual effects of this 5, 10, 15, 20 years right. from now. But everybody was somehow directly or indirectly affected by it. I'm just curious when you see these things um, and see signs of it because he looked very, very nervous to me. Like, you know, when you show that one clip of Nixon and Nixon yeah. says... You know, I'm not a crook. Like, if there's anybody who's not supposed to say it, it's a president. He says, I have so much confidence that if you want to investigate this, you know, that whole thing you were uh, highlighting. Right. And then, and then uh, the way Clinton put it, which I have had no sexual relations. There is, with this. There is no sexual relationship. Yeah, I, I is. So right now, this general. second, I am, yeah. I am not having sex <laughs> with Monica Lewinsky. Right Lewis. now, this I'm instant. not. Right. Yeah, so, you know, these guys are such professionals with wordsmithing, so you don't necessarily know. But the reality is, you know, if uh, Anthony Fauci gets recognized by Guardian as the sexiest man alive, maybe we ought to hold, hold him accountable for it what decisions he's made on what we need to do with this. Because I don't know if you're laughing or not. He was really recognized the sexiest man alive by Are Guardian. you serious? I'm actually being dead serious. <laughs> you, you, you didn't know about this? He was. Well, no, I didn't. I didn't know well, about now that. You know. You, know, you, you just heard from the sexiest him, man alive. That's what you that just. That gives me hope. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> Uh, I we should we should go tweet Guardian and say, hey, can we make the top ten list? I don't know the yeah, top ten yeah, list. Literally. Put a list for it. But okay, uh, uh, final thoughts here. I know you uh, uh, run a uh, podcast as well called Best Case, Worst Case, and you guys sit there and actually bring people in and you go through different cases. Tell us a little about the podcast you guys run. So yeah, Francie Hakes and I, Francie was a former state and federal prosecutor, and she and I interview cops and lawyers and related law enforcement professionals about the best case and the worst case of their career. The point is we want to show people in the public what the spectrum and the continuum of cases is like for a law enforcement officer, street cops, detectives, prosecutors, defense attorneys, everybody in that process. We haven't yet interviewed a judge. We'd love to. But everybody in that process is affected by the cases that come before them. And there are people who have literally spent two, three, four decades working on a case to ultimately resolve it because they couldn't let it go. And some of these cases really affect people. I know that they have affected me. Even though I developed a clinical detachment while I'm working on the case, while I'm analyzing a case of, of you know, brutality or, or sexual victimization, I have to detach clinically while I'm doing it. But I'm still a human being. And I understand what went, that person went through. And I have a tremendous amount of empathy. And, and many law enforcement officers carry around all this pain and suffering that they are exposed to. And it can ruin lives and marriages, you know, on the part of law enforcement officers. And especially when the public is is sort of geared up against them and and they still are out there risking their lives every day to try to keep the peace. And this is the goal of best case, worst case, to show how who these people are that choose a life of law enforcement and how their careers can go from one extreme of, of success to another extreme of, of just horrific failure. Well, we're going to put the link below, below to your podcast. I love the name Best Case, uh, Worst Case. Like I said earlier, uh, from watching your videos, being a great teacher, man, listening to you, uh, I get smarter about your world of how you do what you do, all aspects of it. I appreciate you for taking the time and being a guest on Valuetainment. By the way, 
Some tells me if you and your uh, co-hosts were to take a little bit more time to go deeper and study more of the Fauci, Rand Paul back and forth. They've had like six rounds. If this was a Rocky, they're on Rocky 12 already. I mean, they, they, they've gone back okay. and forth. So there's so much content for you to come up to your four-hour number to increase the 25% rate. I think yeah. if you did that, I think you may get a few million downloads of that episode because the world okay. is very curious. So All right, again, well, I will, I will definitely tell Francie about your suggestion, and, and we'll do that because one of the things is that Francie and I, we have this sort of brother sister kind of situation where we kind of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, gig each other and poke, yeah, poke at each good. other. And and we have very different ways of looking at things. So it, it would be great. It would be great. I, I be tell you, matter of fact, if you guys do that and it's a long form, I would share it with everybody. A matter of fact, we may even bring both of you guys in for a live podcast and share it with everybody and drive even more people Great. to your podcast. So, well, but I'd be curious. Absolutely. I'd be very curious. I, I'm writing it down right now. Jim, the moment you guys get a text us, let us know. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll follow up with you guys on that. But, Jim, Great. once again, appreciate your time. Sincerely, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Anytime. Thank you. So do you feel like you're qualified now to be an FBI agent? Maybe at least go apply for it. What an interesting way of how they detect everything and what they do, right? I was fascinated by it. If you enjoyed it as much as I did, give it a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to the channel. Two other interviews for you. You heard me talk a lot about Paul uh, Maleri from UK. If you've never seen him, Mallory, click over here to watch the interview. The other one is an interview I did with former insider, FBI agent Donnie Barasco, a.k.a. Joe Pistone. It's got like 5 million views. If you've never seen that, absolutely fascinating. Click here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.